so today we're actually going to do um, something a little bit different uh, leading into the, su- the summer on the mount. Um, we tend to do things differently all the time around here, but I, I was reading through Matthew 6, uh, which is kind of the text that we're using today, and I kept reading through that text, and it just spoke to me, and so many things spoke to me, and I was like, where do we go from here? And um, then I read it in the message translation. Anybody familiar with the message translation? So Eugene Peterson um, was a man who uh, translated by himself into, it's more like a paraphrase, but it's beautiful. It's a little more common language today. And so I was reading it through over and over. I was like, this is so good. What, what, what do I say? How do, we, how do we handle this text from here? So if you're just joining us, this whole summer, uh, we've been dealing with a sermon series titled The Summer on the Mount. We've been wrestling with two questions. Really, who is Jesus and what did he teach? Uh, a few weeks ago, by the way, we did uh, engage in different views of Jesus, and we invited in um, people to comment and write in what their view was, which turns out we have a diverse group of people here, which is not very surprising, but it is surprising for some people to realize that not everybody views Jesus in the same way. And yet, you can take Jesus seriously and yet not have the same view of somebody else. Or you could take God, a belief in God, and yet have different views of God. And so we're trying to create room and space for that here. Two weeks ago, Angie kicked us off uh, with uh, the Summer on the Mount, uh, making fun of my big ears, by the way. Um, I'm not going to let you live that down. Um, Happy birthday, by the way. Yay! (laughs) And uh, so she kicked us off, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to invite you, uh, if you haven't already, to read through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Um, especially as we continue on this next few weeks, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, because they're powerful words, uh, probably the most concise words of Jesus' teachings. Many scholars believe that probably that Jesus did not teach them all in one setting, but maybe taught them repeatedly over a time and that the author kind of combined them in one setting, in one sermon on the mount. So today we pick up in Matthew 6. And what we're going to do, let's go back for one second. What we're going to do here is we're actually going to go through chunk by chunk and just read through and kind of open it up for a little bit of observation and discussion. And we'll see where that takes us. Um, A few things to keep in mind as we begin Uh, A few weeks ago, we talked about four different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each Gospel was written by a different person for a different audience. Matthew was written primarily to a Jewish audience. It quotes the Hebrew Scriptures more than any other Gospel. Uh, It also confronts the Pharisees more harshly than any other Gospel. And we'll see that in this text. And if you read through Matthew 5 and 6, there's a lot of comparing and contrasting. The Pharisees do it this way, but you should do it this way. Um, also, the, the, uh, the entire Gospel of Matthew was uh, formulated in five different discourses throughout. And many scholars believe that's kind of tip- typology of Moses who brought the Torah or the five books of the, the uh, Hebrew Scriptures or the law and depicting, the author trying to depict Jesus as a sort of new Moses, bringing not new as in different teachings, but taking the teachings and sort of bringing them to fulfillment. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, which really means to bring it to completion. Jesus seems to be saying, yes, you've got some of it, but it was always meant to go a little bit deeper. Um, Matthew 5 is when the Sermon on the Mount begins, and Matthew 5 focuses primarily on right action with other human beings. This is where you have, uh, you have heard it said, but I say to you, you've heard it said uh, not to murder, but I say to you not to be angry. Uh, You have heard it said not to commit adultery, but I say uh, do not lust. So all of this has to do with human relationships. And then chapter six, we uh, move on to more our relationship with God. What does that look like for Jewish people who are now following Jesus? So, um, Matthew 6 focuses on our, our relationship with God. And you can, the first part, you can break it down into almsgiving or how do we give, uh, offering our treasures. Uh, the second is prayer and the third is fasting. And then really the underlying issue that I think the author is addressing, you could ask it as a, a question, would be what is the right way to engage in these practices? So we're going to jump in. Again, we'll see where it goes. We're going to read a chunk 
and then kind of open it up. I think part of this might have been inspired by Mark Johnson last week. Uh, we did an ordination service, but he also invited engagement. Um, and I'm hoping that for some of us, Scripture uh, has, we have a hard time reading the Bible, and I, there is also some beautiful parts in Scripture. So I'm hoping that this exercise will also invite us in to realize, oh, you can engage with Scripture. There's beautiful aspects behind this. And so I'm hoping that we'll all leave here with something, some sort of nugget, something that speaks to us. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, be especially careful when you are trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. Again, this is the message translation. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. That first verse is like an introduction to the whole thing. All right? Don't let your life be a performance for other people. We'll kind of come back at the very end and circle that. So it's introducing. So the author writes, when you do something for someone else, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure. Play actors. This is the word hypocrites, the word that uh, Jesus consistently used for the Pharisees. It was actually a, word, a play actor, someone who wears a mask, who portrays something else. Treating prayer meetings in street corner like a stage, acting compassionate as long as someone is watching, playing to the crowds. They get applause, true, but that's all they get. And then it goes on, so don't do this. When you help someone out, don't think about how it looks, just do it. And you thought Nike came up with that phrase. <laughs> Quietly, I know, that was bad. Dun -dun -dun. <laughs> Quietly and unobtrusively, that is the way your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. So, um, opening it up here. I'm going to just be bold and say, what do you see in this text? What speaks to you? Again, while we do this, two things to keep in mind. One, we do so with respect here, and two, we do so in humility. And I want to invite, if there's anything that's challenging to you specifically, to speak it out. I think it's easy for us to read text sometimes and say, oh, if so-and-so heard that, or those people heard that. But what does it mean and speak to you? What are your observations? in this text? What jumps out to you? And so we're in this auditorium. So when you speak, speak a little bit loudly and um, try to keep it as brief as you can. So who would like to be first? Observations, things that stand out to you. Angie. Right. So it gives us, she was saying, gives us reflection on, on also who God is and how God acts. Um, that's really good. Yes, you don't have to prove God, God's love extends to you. How many, like myself, will struggle with that, right? Like I feel like, oh, if I just did better, and then when I don't do good, oh, I feel shame, and maybe God doesn't love me as much. Any other thoughts here? So our ego is tied into that often, and how do we let our ego go? Which is, yeah, I think it hits right on. That our ego is the one that's play acting for other people. So we're going to come back again to that at, at the very end, but it's really hard, and I think that's why it's counter-cultural, not so much, like, oh, I dress differently, and I don't use certain words, but yet the culture constantly caters towards those who act out and want validation from others, and what does it mean to uh, release your ego in that way? Um, we're going to kind of keep moving on step by step, and if there's something that stood out you didn't get to say, you're welcome to bring that forth, but before we move on, I, I wanted to highlight, and Angie um, spoke on this, and it stood out to me a lot, and that's the very last uh, part, which is this is the way your God who conceived you in love working behind the scenes. And one of the things that I found, and probably at the core uh, of what I try to do, is recognizing that how we view God reflects how we become. So last week, Mark Johnson showed a, a video, if you were here, of a guy with a bullhorn, right? Repent, you're going to burn in hell, uh, stupid people. And uh, that video is not uh, singular to that person alone, but we've all met people like that. And what's interesting is at the core, I think, that that person's view of God was a God who is angry, a God who is maybe wrathful, a God who is condemning, a God who is saying, you turn or burn right now. And he's just reflecting that out. Uh, 
It was about a year ago, I think, there was a couple that was a part of the church that um, has moved to another state. And uh, she, we were talking about this, and she titled this phrase that will forever stick into me. Her name was Anna. For those of you who know, she said, angry God, angry Anna. And so if our picture of God is angry or judgmental or hierarchical or misogynist or whatever it is, then that reflects how we will begin to act in the world. And at the core, I think what we see with a lot of fundamentalism and ultra-conservative uh, religions is their view of God being reflected out to the world. And so what we strive to do here, as, uh, as Jackie mentioned, as Jacob prayed, is unconditional love to people that also holds people accountable because it extends to all. So there's justice aspect too that we're working on. Let's go to the next slide here and continue on. And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All, okay, so now we're talking a little bit more specifically about prayer. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers. Hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so your ego doesn't have room to shine, right? So you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God. You'll begin to sense God's grace. So what stands out to you in this passage? Don't have to perform. There is a peace there. <laughs> God doesn't care how many Facebook likes you have. Gosh, I have to say, yeah, that's, it is a hard one for me. Sometimes I post things and I'm like, why do I keep checking back? How many people like, you know? <laughs> like it, and it, and uh, they have tested in uh, like neuroscience and let, it does portray a similar hit of, uh, what is it, dopamine or whatever release uh, as drugs. And so it can be addictive. So it's just interesting how that works. How is this so far? A little bit different, right? <laughs> The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense or that BS. <laughs> this is your father you're dealing with. He knows better than you what you need. With God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. We'll go to the next slide. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best, as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. I think you could deal with two. Uh, keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Um, and it ends, of course, with amen. And something interesting. So this is the Lord's Prayer that we say in a different translation every Sunday. And a lot of it, I think, is, I don't know that it's meant to be a formula, as in, like, if you say these special words, then it's like, oh, oh, that's how you pray. But I think in context, it's pointing out that the Pharisees would often stand on street corners and speak in long discourses and prayers so everyone could hear. And it's reframing that. Oh, you don't need these long discourses when you pray, but rather something like this will suffice. So in prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. Interesting. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. For a while, and I think this is true of a lot of people, it's their, their view of God is if you mess up, then God gets really angry at you, kind of banishes you. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I gotta repent. So then God will say, okay, come back. It's okay. Where I think, now I definitely view it very differently in that when we make poor choices, we kind of cut ourselves off a little bit from God. And repentance, meaning when we look back and say, realize what we've done wrong, that our choices have maybe caused brokenness or hurt or pain in our life or others' lives, then restores that. And I don't know that God ever really left, but I think we've kind of created that place. And then repentance... I in more progressive or liberal circle, circles, sometimes we steer away from that word repentance. But I still, finding it in a different light, find it extremely powerful. Not so much like I have to repent in order for God to forgive or I might go to hell, but repentance in like I'm realizing the things that I do that hurt other people and hurt myself. 
and I'm recognizing those patterns in my life and coming back and realizing, oh God, you're here, you've been here all along. So he was talking about how we're not able to receive God's forgiveness when we harbor unforgiveness in our own life. When you practice some appetite-denying discipline to better concentrate on God, don't make a production out of it. So now we're shifting to kind of the fasting aspect of it. It might turn you into a small-time celebrity, but it won't make you a saint. If you go into training inwardly, act normal outwardly. Shampoo you, please. Shower. (laughs) Comb your hair. Brush your teeth. Wash your face. God doesn't require attention getting devices. He won't overlook what you're doing. He'll reward you well. And, and many of us know this, but this is, again, confronting kind of how the Pharisees acted. So at that time in first century, Jews and then Jew, Jewish Christians, both of them fasted roughly twice a week. And when they did, they would make it a way so that everybody else knew you were fasting, how I looked, the clothes I wore. I am holy and separated because I am fasting right now. And what is this? It's kind of confronting that right here. So now the text transitions here for more of our relationship to God and specific things uh, that we do and how we give and how we pray and how we fast to a more general observation. It's, it's almost a different genre. Some, some people I was reading kind of think it's more along the wisdom genre of Proverbs. And uh, rather than giving us norms for the right way to act in specific situations, when we pray, when we give, when we fast, now it's general guidance. In other words, you could ask the question, how do we orient our lives as a whole? So now we continue on reading through. There's a next slide here. I'm going to kind of jump through these a little bit quicker. But it says, don't hoard treasures down here where it gets eaten by moss and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is is the place you will most want to be. It's also the place that you'll end up being. It's interesting. One of the things I was thinking about, and it's really a question, is where, what is heaven here? I don't think it's talking about in your future, someday, but how do you store up treasures in heaven? Um, instead of more material possession, how do we store up treasures that have lasting impact in our life. Yeah. It is interesting that where you, where you think about, I mean, that old saying is where you spend your time and your money, right? Show me your calendar and your bank account, and I'll show you what matters most in your life. I think it's challenging, and it's good for us to kind of reconsider that, reflect on that. Where is your treasure? Because that's where you'll end up residing if you're focused on material possessions. That's where your heart will end up being. What does that look like for you? That's very good. So more or less, and I think what uh, Jack was getting at, how do we invest in things that last, that are eternal in value, right, instead of temporary? That's hard. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's hard. I mean, the tennis shoes, man. It feels good to buy tennis shoes, you know? It feels it's, It is. It's like, ah. Oh. It's not eternal when I post things on Facebook. Next slide. <laughs> Your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will live. I think a lot of this undergird, this uh, part right here is about uh, greed and selfishness. And when you... You know, you look out and you can see others, and if you pull down the blinds and you're only looking inward, what a dark and damp, uh, damp life that is, and how greed kind of corrupts us. If you can't worship two gods at once, or you can't <laughs> worship two gods at once, loving God, one God will end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money alone. Of course, that word money is translated mammon in some texts, which is the Greek word memona, which is really has anything to do with material possessions. So one of the takeaways from this and the questions that I leave for all of us is what gods do you worship? And I mean, really worship means to ascribe worth or value to something. So we may not actually worship and bow down to the god of Baal or whatever, but what areas of our life do we ascribe worth 
to. And I think if we're honest, we all ascribe worth to, from time to time, things that are not eternal or everlasting. There may, there may have never have been uh, a harder time to be a Christian than in America today, <laughs> in the capitalistic society we live in. And then you have religion that can just kind of piggyback off of that. We're kind of going to shift here in, in just a moment. But one of the things that I think you guys, everybody sort of touched, whether it's this ego or this drivenness for a consumeristic society, um, or it's a show. Um, but in reflecting on all this, it's interesting to see how if we don't prioritize our life and reprioritize our life and reflect, that our life just tends to naturally fall out of whack. By, and I was like, why? Why is that? One of the things I love most, or one of my favorite seasons in, in the Christian calendar is Lent, um, which begins on Ash Friday, where somebody rubs dirt on your face, or ash on your face in the form of a cross, and says, uh, from the dust you have come, from dust you will return. And I know it's, it sounds a little bit morbid, uh, but I think it's helpful for us to realize, oh, our lives are fleeting, they're temporary. What are we doing with our lives to reflect on that? I like um, New Year's resolutions, I know some people don't. I like most, not what you commit to, but the fact that it makes us think and reflect on our life. And I think so many times with life, we're just skimming the surface and it's good to stop what matters most. Last year, what did I do? This year, what do I want to do? And reflect on that. And I think one of the things and reasons why our life gets out of tune so easily is because it's easy to follow um, the validation of other people and other things. Um, for example, uh, one of the thing, most important things that I do in my life is being a parent to two boys, right? But they don't worship me. <laughs> they, they don't say, Dad, you're awesome. Oh, gosh, we just love listening to you, and we'll follow every word you say as soon as you say it, and we'll just tell you how great you are. No, it's hard work, but it's the most important work. My wife doesn't worship at my feet, <laughs> right? But my relationship with my wife is extremely important. And I think one of the things that happens in, when affairs start to happen is somebody else starts to give you attention and validation, and then you begin to follow that in unhealthy ways. Um, recently, I watched a movie. It's, uh, it's a great movie. I love stupid comedies. Um, which is weird if you know me. You're like, what? He's so you know, light and serious all the time. I think because I need to laugh. Uh, so Dumb and Dumber was one of my all-time favorites growing up as a kid. Um, so I watched a movie called The Change Up. And it's with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Jason Bateman. And um, it is crude, and it does have a lot of four-letter words uh, in it, more than a few. Uh, but one of the things in it, uh, Ryan Reynolds is basically this uh, pothead actor who is completely irresponsible. And Jason Bateman is this ultra-responsible uh, family man who's just driven. He's an attorney. And they get drunk one night, go pee on a fountain, and wish to switch spots. So then they wake up the next morning in each other's bodies, and this is the entire movie. And Ryan Reynolds learns, as Jason Bateman, to take responsibility. To like, oh, I need to follow through. I need to take care of my family. This is things that matter. Not smoking dope and just hanging out all the time. And then uh, Jason Bateman learns oh my gosh, uh, you learn throughout the, mov the movie that he grew up pretty poor and worked his way through college and did all these other things and eventually couldn't turn it off. It was like, achieve the next thing, the next thing. I need to be partner, I need to do this. And he learns, oh my gosh, the most important things are my relationships, my family and others, and I've got this out of whack. And so it's kind of a, a neat movie in that regard. Um, as, as we close, and the last few things I wanted to invite us to do is to reflect on our lives. There was a, a lady named um, Bonnie Ware who wrote a book um, that came from an article that was so popular that she wrote a book titled the, La or the Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Some of you might have heard of that. She worked in palliative care for a while and worked with people with serious illness and found reoccurring themes and things that they often regret. Um, before we jump in, one, one last thing. Um, I used to think the teachings of Jesus were primarily about how to get to heaven when you die. But these are actual instructions on how to be human, how to prioritize your life, how to find what matters most and live into that. And so the next slide, as we begin, I'm just going to jump through these quickly as we wrap up. 
But here's the top five regrets of the dying and see if any of these speak to you. One, I wish that I had let myself be happier. I posted this on, uh, let's go back real quick. I posted this on Facebook, uh, that happiness is a choice and how we choose to live our lives. Uh, a lot of it is how we choose to set up our lifestyle, where we spend our money, how we spend our time, all of that stuff. And sometimes um, we're not happy because of our choices have gotten us in a place. I'm not saying that's always true. I think there's very real depression and there's very uh, real things that we need to work through and take medication for. But maybe if you're not happy with your life, reflect on that. The next slide, number four. I wish I had stayed in touch with friends. Somehow you can just detach and go your own separate ways and realize, oh, I don't have very many friends. But are there friends close to you that you get in touch in on a regular basis? One of the regrets of people who were on their deathbed was, I wish I had stayed in touch with friends. The next slide. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. And this one's interesting. I think this one had to do with more. I just went along with things and I didn't voice my thoughts, my, my feelings as much. And we all know people who are overly opinionated. I don't think it's saying that. Don't be one of those people. But don't hide yourself. Let you be who you are. The second most frequent regret of the, the dying is I wish I didn't work so hard. Um, she, Bonnie writes that this was true of every single male person she encountered. Um, and I think that's shifting because more and more women are working. And so this is true of anybody who's working, I think, is that they're, especially in our society, capitalistic society, it's so easy to work harder and harder and harder. Uh, and you get to the end of your life and just say, I wish I wouldn't have worked so hard. The last regret of the dying, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself not the life others expected me to live. So as the worship team comes back up here and the last slide in here, I want to invite you guys to do something. Really, I think a lot of Matthew 6 was reprioritizing your life, how you do what you do, but also what matters most to you. And taking that alongside of uh, somebody who's walked alongside of people who are dying and had regrets, and just ask yourself, is there one of these? Well, there is. Let's just start there, right? Which one of these is the one that stands out to me the most right now? And the second one, to leave with, a practical way to leave, what can I do so that when I get to the end of my life, I don't have this regret? I think we'll all make mistakes. I'm not talking about mistakes at the end of our life. Oh man, I'm talking about things that we did and choices that we set up on a regular basis that we got to the end of our life and like, oh gosh, I could have easily have contacted my friends. I could have easily have not worked so hard. So what regret, what thing do you see in your life right now? And what can you do to, to make it so you don't get to the end of your life and live with that regret?